The GMTK Game Jam 2025, arguably one of the biggest game jams there is. I paired up with a friend of mine to create a game for the game jam, which means we have about four days to make a game. No problem, right? We're going to make a 2D game, except I'm a 3D artist and I've never made a 2D game before. And we're going to use Godot, which is also pretty normal, but I'm using Godot for the first time ever. I've never even looked at their website, let alone opened the engine. What could go wrong? But before we begin the game jam, let me know if you took part in it yourself down in the comments below. How did it go? Let me know, share the details. Now this might sound like I'm making it up, but those words you see on screen right now they are some theme guesses I took before the theme went live, and as you can see, I guessed the theme right. And maybe this was a sign that the game jam was going to go really well. Probably not. With the theme of loop in our minds, we hopped on Discord and started to spit out some ideas and directions we could go in. I'm thinking and circling something. Like a puzzle game. Uh, mm. I guess roguelite type. Tying simulator, right? That's, that's, <laughs> that's also if you're a sheep herder and you have to run around sheep. I don't think it's necessarily thrilling gameplay, but... You, you, you uh, have me at sheep. <laughs> I'm at sheep right now, yeah. With ideas flying around, we had a few different directions to go in, focusing on the keyword of loop. However, I then put forward a different suggestion. Do we have a type of game we want to make? Because this is such a broad term. We can, we can, you can make of... anything fit at this point. So maybe we could kind of think about the type of game we might want to make and some fun themes and just kind of be like, okay, well, where's the loop inside this? We spoke about various ideas within the realms of running a store, day cycles, the 2D perspective of the game, merging objects to create new ones. So we had an idea in general direction, but we kept falling short as we weren't sure of the theme of the game. What are we making? Where are we? What's the objective? Until this. What if we took that idea and applied it to the universe? All my friends are robots. Okay. <laughs> so I'm listening. <laughs> working at a shop. Was that a bow tie? <laughs> okay. Yeah. The tiny little <laughs> cube arms. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Got little wheels. Now you might be wondering what the hell I'm talking about. What is All My Friends Are Robots? Good question, dear viewer. A while ago, we discussed a game idea of a stylized roguelike game called All My Friends Are Robots, but we never got past the stage of an early prototype, and it is still an idea we occasionally discuss. It's also a world and theme which we both like, so we quickly got on board with this theme of weird and wacky robots, and the pieces started to land into place. Now, we discussed this idea for another couple of hours, but I'll summarize it to you in about 15 seconds. Imagine papers, please, but set in a wacky robot world, and you're probably thinking along the right lines. You are a robot shop owner and have customers come into your shop looking for new parts. You collect parts by blasting your customers and collecting their drop parts in your scrap pile. Now, why would you shoot your customers? That's because not all robots are as they seem. Some are malfunctioned. Malfunctioned equals bad. And the way to know if a robot is malfunctioned is if they are lying about something. You get information about them, such as their appearance, their personality, number of limbs, etc. And if you determine them to be telling the truth, you may serve them. If they are lying, blast them. At the end of the day, you get a report based on how well you did. And if your store performed well enough, then you continue to the next day, like a loop. The time had come to open Godot for the first time. Hello, Godot. How do we move around? All right, we're moving, we're, we're cooking. Sprite 2D. After getting a little familiar with the UI and seeing what options there were, I wanted to see if there were any controls for UVs, as I was wondering whether to paint an atlas sheet of robot parts to then scale and move across via those UVs, hence those faces you see. Don't judge me. And within minutes of being inside Godot, I was searching up code. Now it's worth mentioning at this point that I don't know any programming languages. And I didn't have much luck with the UVs, but I did get the texture to turn green, which is of no use to me, but hey, it's a start. As much as I wanted to explore more Godot and become a true programmer, I do have artwork to make for the game, so I best get started. Get a lovely bit of grass going, looking good. Ah, shit. I should really do something. <laughs> As I mentioned at the start, I'm a 3D artist, but I want to try some 2D. I feel like that's part of being in a game jam to try new things. However, I want to strike a balance between trying something new and doing a different workflow, but still trying to produce something which looks decent and feels fairly unique. So after some thinking, my plan was to use 3D to make 2D. I create a seven step process to go from this to this. 
Number one, create a 3D model. I'm using a character model that I created a while ago for all my friends and robots to help get things underway. Take a screenshot. The 3D model is to act as a guide for perspective and form. It's basically making up for some of my weaker foundational 2D skills, but obviously keep that to yourself, no one knows. Number two, sketch around the main shapes and forms. Number three, Hide the 3D model and reinforce your sketching where it feels necessary. Number four, using a brush of your choice, paint over your 3D model, reinforcing the shadows, the highlights, and introducing variation within the midtones. Number five, using your original screenshot, blend it with multiply and tweak the levels. We're doing this to make sure the depth is really popping. Number six, color and add final sketch details. Do as much or as little as you like here, it's your painting. I'm mostly looking to just break up some of the gray tones. And number seven, Final tweaks and touches, soft light layers for subtle tinting and some gradients. Now I repeat this workflow for all the pieces and eventually, after a few hours, you have a 2D robot. And I think he looks pretty cool. I'm gonna call him TV head. And of course, sign the work, otherwise it's not officially finished. And no, that is not my real signature. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. With day two coming to a close, it was time to catch up with Julian and see how the gameplay was coming along. Now, as usual, we spoke for hours, so I'll summarize. Julian had done a lot considering that he only had a couple of hours free that day. The core functionality was in place with a countdown timer working, the function of creating a customer, the display of verification text, clicking and dragging parts, adding them to your scrap pile, and even a check to stop the player advancing to the next customer if your scrap pile was too full. So quite a lot of core gameplay. Yeah. And after telling Julian of my troubles with programming, he was even kind enough to talk me through his code, which genuinely helped me because I could ask questions like, is this basically this in Unreal Engine? And developing new knowledge from already existing knowledge, I personally find it to be a huge help in learning new things. I assume that's not just a me thing and it's pretty common, but let me know in the comments below if you're the same way. After seeing the first pass of gameplay last night, I really wanted to see it with some artwork, so I woke up with one intention to finish as many robot parts as possible. I'd already made a robot using the previously existing mesh I'd made a while ago, so it's time to make some fresh meshes to use as a foundation. I started by making some heads based on the list of theme ideas we had mentioned on day one. So a few examples being the pyramid head, flashlight head, siren head, and my personal favorite, this guy, the exposed or wired head, or as I call him, Two-Face. There was a lot to model as I also made a few bodies such as this furnace body, a slot machine body, and continuing with the wide look, a body split in half. Partway through this work, I did send the painted robot I did the day before to Julian, and he brought up a good point about pivot points. We need each part's point of connection slash socket to be positioned consistently within the PNG. So when we switch one part out for another, it'll automatically connect with no further adjustment required. In the same way a 3D model needs consistent pivot points, we needed to do that in 2D basically. I did also get to see the first character in the engine, which was really nice. The modeling doesn't stop there though, as we need arms and legs. I had been modeling for quite a few hours at this point so after this arm which i think looks pretty cool i got a bit lazy with the legs and reused the top half of the original robot and that does pretty much bring day three to a close i spent longer modeling than expected and had less time that day than expected so with those two factors i was left feeling like i hadn't done enough that day in reality i had but I was aware that there was a lot to do going into day four, which I was a bit worried about. And something I haven't mentioned so far is that Julian is not free on the Sunday, so we need as much as possible done at the end of Saturday. As you can see from a quick desk footage I recorded, I stayed up late to try and make some painting progress, but I only got a start on this siren head. And then I called it a day and went to bed. And I woke up ready for day four. Suddenly, I was awake. The last full day of development with Julian and my lack of robot parts was slightly roadblocking him. So my first job was to get my Bob Ross on and get to painting. We have happy accidents. I got these textures set up in Godot and tested the pivot points between swapping parts and it's working nicely. As much as I was finding the artwork surprisingly satisfying to create considering I'm not a 2D guy, it was time to find some audio because a game without audio is like, uh, it's like, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's bad, okay? I'm a big fan of audio and I think sounds are very memorable. So I'm curious, what's the most memorable sound effect in any game for you personally? Let me know in the comments down below. The first and main thing we wanted to get good audio for was the shotgun. We wanted a nice, loud, punchy sound to make it as satisfying as possible to blast some robots. 
I gathered a bunch of sounds ranging from doors opening, metal clinking, and I found these really great cartoon robots talking. It's perfect. I had the audio on my PC, and I was feeling brave. So I entered Godot, equipped with a coding overview from Julian two nights ago, and Google at my fingertips. Sound? Nope. Audio? Audio Stream Player 2D. That sounds like what I'm looking for. So I can drag this sound effect into stream, and I then need to access the stream properly in the code. Let's just double check this. So if I reference my audio stream, and then do dot to access properties. Okay, play. And just a zero. That might work, question mark. Oh, hold on. We're doing it. We're coding. I went on to create variables for the sound, set up a function which accesses the audio stream player, passes through a sound reference, and then plays it. My understanding of programming heavily comes from my experience in Blueprints, so once I started viewing Godot's scripting in a similar way, it started to click a lot more. For example, dragging this audio stream into the script is like dragging a component into a graph. The dot, to view the properties, is like dragging off a pin. You find something you think fits, like play in this case, and instead of putting numbers in boxes, we put them in brackets instead. Now that doesn't cover everything in the scripting, but all of a sudden this scary looking page of code and syntax now feels approachable. And no matter whether this game comes out amazing or poorly, I'll have that experience and perspective in scripting going forward, which is small, but valuable, and I think that's one of the many values of doing game jams. Julian came in and made it so the robots stop talking if you shot them, and we found it a bit too amusing. It's just, it's just ultimately satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. <laughs> Once we'd stopped bullying the robots, we discussed a few things, such as telling the player how to play the game. We made a welcome message, which gave some context and said what to do. However. In hindsight, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, I think we could have spent more time considering the player's first minute within the game. We, understandably so, focused on the overall bigger picture of the gameplay loop, but I think the first minute of playing the game can feel a bit... confusing? I'm not sure if that's the right word, but you've got to find your feet a little bit, and if you didn't read the welcome message, which is definitely going to be a thing, you might find yourself asking, Hey, what's going on? We also didn't give the player any scrap parts to start with, so unless they encounter a malfunction quite quickly, they need to shoot a normal robot, and that does feel a bit conflicting with the aim of the game. But whilst Julian was working on that stuff and we were chatting away, I was busy solving the issue of the game having no environment. Using Julian's beautiful sketch for how we can diegetically display the verification information, we went from this to this. The workflow is going to be the same as it has been throughout, but the main difference being that this is an environment from a fixed angle which needs to allow space for certain pieces of information to display. We closed the day out by chatting about some of the text we can have each robot say, and we even got an early look at what the game looks like with a partially complete environment background, which was very exciting to see. We're so close to being done. <laughs> Today we made a lot of progress, our programming audio. And it has made me less nervous about tomorrow, with it being the last day and the day of submission. But there's no drilling tomorrow. <laughs> and I can't help but think, what if there's a code problem? Although I don't know if you've heard, but uh, I'm a bit of a programmer myself now, so... Uh, yeah. I'm still a bit nervous. The final day! It has arrived! In the UK, 6pm is the magic time for submitting the game. Nothing should go too wrong, but who knows? And I do need to finish this background first and foremost. One of the main things missing was the scrap pile. I needed some spare parts and both fortunately and unfortunately, I had made a bunch of robot parts which we didn't have time to include. So I grabbed them and made sure they didn't go to complete waste as they populated the scrap pile. I also made sure not to have any parts which are being used in the game be clearly identifiable within the pile as to avoid any visual conflict between background and actual parts, which segues me nicely onto a problem I had. Parts are a bit small. I think I need to increase the size of them. Um, some of these pieces get a bit lost in the background, particularly these grey pieces. Yeah, I can see these parts getting easily missed. Uh, I think I might need to play around with this. 
This is where some of my perfectionism kicked in, as I went back and forth with a few options for longer than I really should have. But the first thing I did was set up a point light 2D, added it to the part scene so I applied to all the parts, I knew it would help them stand out against the whole background. For the scrap pile I tried multiple versions, but I ultimately landed on quite a simple solution of making it darker with more transparent line detailing. That and the point light solved the problem. Previous to this issue, I also solved another one with the next customer button being a bit obscured by the robot's position. So I wrestled with my messy Photoshop layers to try and move it up. Now we have clearer parts in the scrap pile and a more visible and obvious next customer button. Happy days. Shame it took me so long considering they're relatively simple changes, but trial and error can take some time. The night previous, we had also spoken about adding more requests to the robot so the variety stayed nice and fresh. The way Julian has set up the code is that there is a big array containing request variables. These request variables have values within them such as body part requirement, body part requests, emotion, their speech text and so forth. So it's very flexible for me to go in and try adding some additional content. It was time to put my programmer gloves back on and see what happens. Okay, nice, that works. Sir, you are missing a head. <laughs> you are not meant to be missing a head. Please, can I have a new head? That's accidentally very fitting. Well, this is a very good start. Okay, you're just a leg. And now there's just nothing. Where are the parts? See, this is what happens when you leave me alone in a new engine. Now, to be fair, I was trying stuff Julian hadn't done in his variables, such as or statements and random ranges for arrays. I don't think I was doing it the right way, so I took a step back and things got back to normal. It's okay, panic over. And I did get some new requests in, so there's even more content variation, which is really nice. This day was meant to be just finishing the environment, quick playtest, and then getting the itch.io page sorted for submission. Yeah, that, that didn't happen. The Cog of Life version 3 and export. God, it's fast. <laughs> Man, you've got to wait three working days for Unreal Engine to package. The music's so good. Uh, time for celebration, going to have your flashy. You're not flashy. Next. I would love to warm up a little. I do have something for you. You are wired. You are shiny. You seem happy and you've got the right amount of body parts. Okay, I will help you. I want to try something fresh. Can I have a new head? Uh, no. I have a split and headache. No, you do not. You are malfunctioned. Trying to sneak in here and take my parts. How dare you. Oh. I shot a customer. But hey, you don't want to watch me play the game when you can go play it for yourself for free over on itch.io right now. Link is in the description, so go check it out. If you've enjoyed this video, I think you'll enjoy the game. I will be revisiting Godot again in the future. My first impressions of it have been positive, but I have also realized that I need to develop some programming skills to really delve into the engine a bit more and give it a proper run. It doesn't end there for you though, dear viewer, because there's more content for you to watch and there's probably something on screen right now. Give it a click, see what happens. And on your way out, hit the like button. It helps a lot. And also make sure you subscribe because there is more content on the way, which you don't want to miss. 